Hello everyone, my name is Manolis Spinorolakis, the founder of Reality Crowd TV, and welcome to a special episode entitled Vicken Office Hours Episode 2. This is provided by the Vicken, which is Virtual Incubator and Crowdfunding Network, a community for entrepreneurs to get the resources they need in an online environment that simulates what it would feel like being in a traditional business incubator. And so this program is for the members of the community who have joined the, the incubator to actually ask their questions live on air to the experts that we have with us. Uh, before I get to actually introducing our guests, uh, if you would like to participate in a future episode, uh, you, there are links within the Google Hangout on air that shows you how you can sign up. And then once you're signed into the Virtual Incubator online platform, you will get periodic emails requesting your participation in these type of events. So without further ado, I'd love to get started. Uh, let's introduce our guest, Roxanne Davenport, first. She is the founder and CEO of, of a nonprofit called Seizure of the Day. And Roxanne, please give us a 30-second introduction of yourself. Hey, everybody. I'm Roxanne Davenport. I started Seizure of the Day uh, wanting to raise epilepsy awareness more uh, because not everybody knows much about it. So I uh, just want to bring more awareness and start raising money to help either bring uh, more money for research or help people with uh, their insurance payments for their medicine. It's horrible. So that's what I need your help with. Excellent, Roxanne. Thank you for joining us again. You've been on a number of our programs in the past, so uh, thanks again for joining us. Um, our next guest is a new member in the, uh, in the virtual incubator. Uh, his name is Arthur Ambrosino, the founder, president, and chief engineer of the, uh, let me make sure I pronounce it right, it's called the Great Sacandaga Lake Deepening Project. And right. Arthur, pleasure to be with you, and uh, please give a brief 30-second uh, introduction for us. Okay, uh, I made a huge discovery uh, of what is known as a green schist facies. Uh, it has to do with plate tectonics and the Great Second Dog Lake that I own the mineral rights to is was once a billion years ago the ancient North American continental shelf like Massachusetts or like Boston and New York City are today. So uh, green schist facies uh, have to do with extension when uh, Euro Eurasia uh, split from subduction underneath the continental shelf and uh, the last, the, the, the crust thins becomes like taffy and the last hydrospaces of the magma which are highly mineralogic popped up through in these pegmatites that are all around the basin. You want me to say any more? <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll have to get into a few more of those details but um, but when, when you were telling us about your project, um, it, it sounds remarkable. You, you own 36 square miles of mineral rights under one of the largest man-made lakes in the nation. Yes. And the minerals are worth trillions of dollars, I believe you said. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah the minerals are, are worth $1.8 trillion. I usually say $1.5 uh, because uh, some of the minerals in the lake are so abundant that I would destroy the markets trying to sell them, so they're going to have to be stockpiled. I mean, that's that's incredible, and we, we will get into the details of that soon to kind of understand uh, wh where you need to actually go from there, because uh, yeah. you have the rights. There, there are just a few barriers you have to go through, but we'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. Okay. Um, and, of course, we have our two experts uh, from, our, uh, from our great media partners at headtalker.com, the co-founders, uh, Chris Labonte and Nolan Thompson. And uh, welcome, gentlemen. Uh, great to have you on the show, as always. And please introduce yourselves. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Chris, co-founder of Pet Talker. Uh, thank you for having us on your show, Nolan. And I, I'm Nolan Thompson, the co-founder of Pet Talker. And thanks, Nolan, for having us on the show. Uh, hopefully, this is a good one. As always, I'm sure it'll be a great show. So thank, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us again. Um, so let's start with Roxanne. So Roxanne, 
um, tell us about how you uh, how you decided that you wanted to enter the nonprofit arena, uh, specifically on on epilepsy. Tell us a little bit about yourself and and why uh, you're creating this organization. Okay, uh, started worked in the medical field and um, because of having um, to take call, work overnight, all these long hours, I just started having auras and sick feelings. So um, went to the doctor and found out, well, huh, went to the doctor after I found myself driving in another lane and said, oh, what happened? Well, found out that um, because of a high fever when I was a baby, I have scar tissue in the left side of my brain that caused me to have it's called complex partial petite mal seizures. So, um, because of working, everything all the time I did uh, just worked to death to save money when I was young. So uh, that brought on my seizures. So uh, I had to take. It's a long story. I had surgery, didn't work. Um, gosh, did ultrasound for almost 20 years, and was able to work until I had a wreck. Was seizure free for a while, long enough to drive. And for some unknown, well, I, until this happened, did not know there was so much difference in pharmaceuticals that my insurance company made me switch to a generic brand medicine. And that there's a difference between generic and brand so much that it caused me to wreck. And now that I had a car wreck. My daughter has a titanium ankle. <laughs> Talked about minerals with me. She has a titanium ankle because it shattered her ankle when she was 14. So now she has her ankle can't move, and she's had five seizures in five years. I mean, five surgeries in five years. Since then, I have turned 180 percent in what I do. <laughs> but it's in the medical field, though. Um, wanting to fight for more research on uh, for seizures and epilepsy and get more funding because some, nobody knows about epilepsy so since all this happened to me I still have to fight with my insurance company for fo uh, keeping me on brand name medicine so my seizures somewhat stay controlled now it's wow. horrible it's, yeah the brand name medicine one of them I take four brand names if I wasn't on insurance, it would be $3,900 a month just for one of them. Wow, that is, that's incredible. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that, uh, that unfortunately, uh, you had to, you had to have that incident with your daughter. Um, but at least you're turning that incident to, into mm -hmm. a positive. I mean, now, yeah. now you're making it your, your life's work to make sure that, um, people can eventually find a way to deal with it better than, than the current treatments that, don't seem to have as great of a great of an impact. Um, mm -hmm. and so, and so in your journey, where are you right now in your journey? Um, have you? I, I I know the answer to this, of course, but I just want to <laughs> ask you. Um, you know, how how far have you come? Like, where are you in your journey right now? And, and what's your next step to uh, to get the process started as far as your nonprofit's concerned? Well. I was working with someone else, volunteering with them. Um, doing uh, fundraisers for North Carolina, where I'm at if you can't tell by my accent. Um, we would have um, had a motorcycle bike ride, raised money, we would have parades downtown and have lunches with, um, got to meet some actors and actresses, which was amazing, and um, have restaurants that would give us a night a month for a portion of the profits for the doctor's office, it was a nonprofit doctor's office. So the person that took care of all the tax portions of it left and went back to school to be a lawyer. So that left me with like, oh boy, what do I do now? So unfortunately, I had to leave that office because they didn't have anybody to take care of their fundraising that way. But I kept in touch with everybody, so I said, well, I could go to the Epilepsy Foundation but and wanted to give them all of that help, but they didn't have enough help, manpower for them to do it themselves. So I'm like, okay, 
I will try doing this myself. So <laughs> here I'm asking for help. Someone to maybe tell me where to go with the taxes and things like that. Because I've already have people that can give me two nights a month to give towards profit for a night, you know, for people with restaurants and I can do more. <laughs> Perfect. So I'm, so sort of to summarize as well, so you mentioned as well that you you need to find help to actually incorporate your nonprofit organization because mm -hmm. that's that's part of the process you need to do first as step one. And so yeah. one of the questions in one of the sites you sent me to uh, enlightened me, in fact, on how someone can go about creating a nonprofit. So I actually um, I'm going to share my screen as I kind of share this with you because I think there is a good step that you can actually take. Uh, for your nonprofit, and then when we get to the crowdfunding piece of uh, of the advice, I'm going to bring in uh, our experts, um, Chris and Nolan, uh, about that. So, can you guys see my uh, see my screen at the moment? Yeah. Perfect. So, uh, where I want to start actually is on this site, and, and I'm going to share this with you afterwards, um, and I'll share it with the audience as well. But I found this uh, site called Grant Space. It's it's a service from the Foundation Center. And it just has so many resources for uh, individuals who are looking to do nonprofits. And so one of the things that I found was, how do I start a nonprofit organization? And there really is a few steps that you, that you need to do this. But I mean, obviously, they oversimplify it. But the three steps are, file the Articles of Incorporation with the Secretary of State, apply for tax-exempt status with the IRS, noting that it could take 3 to 12 months for it to happen, and then register with the states that you plan to do fundraising activities. So those are some pretty general um, steps, and I'm sure that you'll have to go through a, a pretty large process to kind of figure all this out. Um, have you already done this preliminary research already, Roxanne? Roxanne, are you still there? I, I'm not, not for not other things. Say, say that again, you haven't done that just yet? Not not for all the states, no. Okay, no problem. So whichever state where you actually reside in, that's your first step. You actually want to use uh, that particular website and just fill in the blanks of whatever form that, that they need. What I would recommend that you do, actually, Roxanne, is use the resources in the virtual incubator to actually ask for feedback at each stage of the application. So if you, if you go ahead and you try to fill out whatever application this, this is on the site, you can actually use our feedback mechanisms, um, including the question and answers application. So like, for instance, let's say there's step one. Um, you know, step one could be, uh, what is the business mission and vision of your nonprofit? You can create a question and say feedback on my nonprofit application could be the title of that question and then you'll you'll type in you know this is what I wrote so far on my particular nonprofit application I'd love some feedback in, in ways to make it sound better from the from the community so because because I know right now you might not have the resources to have somebody do this for you but you at least have this free resource to actually get it done in chunks um, does that make sense, Roxanne? Yeah, thank you. Perfect. And then another resource I found for nonprofits while we're at it, unfortunately, this website, catchafire.org, unfortunately, they do not provide uh, the pre-incorporation help. Unfortunately, they, they need you to be at least uh, fully incorporated before you go for help for them. But what's interesting here is, for nonprofits, you can list a project on their site, and if you end up listing a project on their site, they allow you to choose. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. They allow you to choose which category for you to actually get help with. Um, so, for instance, if I go to launch a project and I need help with fundraising, so that's going to be a piece of what you're going to need help with once you're incorporated. You're going to want to click here including crowdfunding, donor recruitment, that. You want to click See Projects, and you'll be able to ultimately 
come up with a uh, strategy for people to help you with crowdfunding in particular. And what, what does this site really help you do, Roxanne? Catchafire.org is a matching service between volunteers and the nonprofits that they want to help. So if anyone actually replies to your plea for crowdfunding help on Catchafire, chances <laughs> are they will end up doing it at no cost to you if you're a nonprofit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 what, what was that, Roxanne? I have talked to them. I'm echoing. Uh, I have talked to them. Okay. And, uh, they have gotten in touch with me. Mm-hmm. Perfect. So what what happened there? Did did they tell you the same thing that you have to incorporate first? Yeah, and I asked them about websites too. Okay, cool. They answered some questions about the website and um, yeah, about being um, incorporated in a lot of other ones that I've talked to though you have to be five oh one. So that's what's held me up. Uh, absolutely, which then which then brings us to what you found on your own. This website that you sent me before the actual uh, webinar is a uh, is called Unitable Charitable Programs. I've never heard of them until now, so so I I can't uh, I can't advise on the uh, credibility of the site itself. But when I click on fiscal sponsorship and I read through it, it sounds pretty awesome. This site and probably others like it. If you Google fiscal sponsorship, like companies that do sp official fiscal sponsorship you might be able to use their administrative uh, prowess to ultimately do all the legwork for your administrative side of your nonprofit and what you end up needing to do is then just be the fundraising arm of your own nonprofit. So if you feel as though the administrative side might be overwhelming for you personally, you might want to begin starting with something like a fiscal sponsorship which, you know, you know, it, it seems like y you get accepted into this program, you become part of their charity, and any donations to your particular program would be tax deductible. So it looks like all the, f all the actual donations would go to their personal program, but then they would allocate whatever resources that you've raised for your own uh, nonprofit to your particular program. Does that, is, is that uh, sound like what what they do? It it said that they keep out a portion to be like you would be paying them uh, for their to give them a paycheck. So um, they keep eight percent is what when I looked further into it of what you bring in, depending on if it was under a total amount. I believe the number was ten thousand dollars. A year, if you bring in less than that, they keep eight percent, and um, they charge half of. It depends on if you have need something overnight shipped to you, or if you were giving a package to somebody. Um, they charge you so much overnight fee, or things like that. So interesting. Okay. But this, they. Um, they also work with the um, company um, Great. Uh, oh shoot! What's the name of it? Um, <laughs> I just forgot it. I'm so sorry. I'll think of it. Nonprofit for good. Nonprofit oh, for good. The social website. Entrepreneurship. Yeah, another um, for the all their websites, all that, and that's how I found these people who nonprofit for good to work on it. How? Very um, they, they yeah. work with them. So and, um, and let me ask you a question too. And so, so it sounds like then they are a credible organization from a from a very cursory view. You so so you mentioned to me that in order to apply for their program, however, there mm -hmm. is an application fee. And how much was that application fee? It's three hundred eighty-five dollars. Three hundred eighty-five dollars, and so. You know, to me, what that sounds like to me is that it could be a very good use case for a mini crowdfunding campaign. Um, I know $385 doesn't sound like a lot of money, but indeed, um, you know, with, with a limited budget, it is. And so it might be a good
good way to announce uh, your intention uh, to actually go ahead and, um, and and try to run a campaign for this particular application fee. And so, um, is that something that you might want to consider, Roxanne? That that is uh, because of what they had listed that they provided on that site um, with. Uh, they do your taxes. The tax give you a tax ID, and your um, they even provide letters to send out to people that give. Um, they with doing the uh, network for good with your website. Oh gosh, everything that I talked to them about that they had to offer. Their websites look great. <laughs> when I talk to a lady, I keep, she always keeps in touch with me. <laughs> I probably know her phone number by heart. It's uh, how good I liked all their offers for their web apps. So um, when she told me about them, and uh, they even said they could help you with your with traveling for uh, if you need to be at a if you need to give a speak and talk to anyone about what you want to raise money for. Yeah, there's my website. <laughs> mm -hmm. It does need some things. No, I mean, uh, and, and you know what? I I will say this. I will say this. Um, it sounds to me that that might be one of the one of the perfect ways to proceed for you because you obviously you obviously like their program. Uh, you you like the people that that you spoke with. So uh, running that that little running a campaign of that of that magnitude, but then also planning uh, stretch goals in case you do get additional support. I think could be a good way for you to kind of show that there is something tangible you're raising money for, and anything else that you raise above that uh, will go towards other costs that will certainly arise from uh, from being a part of a you know from running a nonprofit. Um, let me let me ask Nolan and uh, and Chris to jump in um, from the crowdfunding perspective. I, I know you guys uh, you, you guys were in the crowdfunding industry. Um, what, what what did you see for nonprofit fundraising? Uh, is crowdfunding effective in that space? Yeah, Manolis, could you repeat that? Sure. Um, I, I was saying uh, for for crowdfunding for nonprofits, uh, and given um, given Roxanne's circumstance, do you think running a crowdfunding campaign uh, for that application fee would be would be something that could be useful? Uh, yeah, I, I definitely think it's something that could be useful because it could let a small audience know what it is that you're trying to accomplish. So if you do a test crowdfunding campaign, see if people are actually behind what you're trying to get done, it could definitely be a great way to test who's going to be engaged and how you can engage them more uh, for your next larger crowdfunding campaign. Excellent. And, um, and so... How how can they use Ped Talker in in connection with the pre-launch to um, to actually help her get the word out right when she launches? Like, can you explain a little bit more about how she can use Head Talker? Yeah. Um, so Head Talker works. Uh, it's similar to crowdfunding, but instead of contributing money, people actually contribute their social media voice. So how you could use it is you could actually complement your crowdfunding campaign and actually take the people that are helping you financially and have them add their social media voice to help spread your crowdfunding campaign to a newer audience that you wouldn't be able to reach just on your own. Um, and if you do talk to people and they say, listen, I love what you're doing, but I don't have any money to contribute to your uh, crowdfunding campaign, you can show them the link to your Head Talker campaign and actually get their support through social media that way. So that way, if they can't help you out financially, they can help you out socially. So they're going to be able to help you out one way or both ways, depending on um, how you convince them to join. Excellent. So I mean, I'm I'm also showing the audience really quickly um, how this works. Uh, I I just saw someone's random campaign for a for a crowdfunding campaign for diabetes. You literally go to their profile, like we see here, and there's three buttons here that allow you to support a campaign uh, with a click of a button on each of the social networks. So, uh, if someone wanted to share on uh, Facebook, for instance, 
you just click uh, click the Facebook button, click Add Support, and then immediately it gets uh, supported. And then after the person supports, we see here that the actual number of supporters has increased uh, to 39 instead of 38. So if this individual reaches 50 supporters, uh, by the time uh, six days passes, then this particular message, the one that says 387 million with diabetes globally uh, are writing this book, this particular message will go off on each person's social channel as if they wrote the actual uh, message themselves. So this is a massive viral marketing tool uh, that can certainly be used for crowdfunding and is in fact used a lot for crowdfunding. So. Um, have you ever used a head talker before, Roxanne? Um, it's funny that you have them on here because I had. <coughs> you're gonna get ready to have a hangout, right? The head talker is gonna have a a hangout or a, a seminar or something. Are y'all gonna? Are you ready to have one, or somebody? Um, want somebody I with you? Unless. I, we're on this one. <laughs> Do you, what now? Did I just miss it? <laughs> no, we're on this hangout right now. No, but maybe somebody else from Head Talk. Well, uh, okay. I'm sorry. That did that, that sound stupid. But I, <laughs> I signed up for, to listen to some what, Head Talker, another hangout with must, Head Talker. Yeah, I mean, it could be a member of their community, too, uh, potentially. <laughs> <laughs> that did sound stupid, didn't it? <laughs> oh, it's okay. Um... <laughs> It's okay. So, uh, yeah, so I don't, yeah, I don't think it, we're on that one, but <laughs> if you send us the link, I'd love to check it out. Because <laughs> right when I saw Head Talker, I was like, "Wait a minute! I know Head Talker from something," <laughs> but it, it's not one of y'all's faces. So, but I know the picture is a person. I think. Do you know a Brian? Um, sounds familiar. Somebody okay. named Brian just uh, launched a giveaway on our site. Well, okay. Well, that's where I, I. Okay. Well, yeah, I had checked into them. I saw y'all up there. Did that answer your question? I'm sorry, Manolas. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, you know, they, they would be a great tool uh, to use when the time comes for you to launch your campaign. Um, one, one last piece of advice too on a platform to use uh, when you do launch, because I, I know that Arthur has been sitting here patiently, so I'd, I'd like to uh, switch over to him shortly. But um, there is a new crowdfunding platform called Launch Leader, and uh, and they're actually a really really good team of guys, and they're actually made for specific projects like yours, Roxanne. Uh, uh -huh. Launch Leader is the uh, is the crowdfunding platform to proto to crowdfund your MVP. So the, the, they're not there for like the large million dollar projects. They're there for the startups who need to crowdfund an MVP or who need to do little step-by-step step, um, step, step funding mechanisms. And as you can see here, uh, people can actually have different funding levels for different financial needs. So this one, for instance, on their, on their, uh, test, uh, on their test site has, I need $99 for a landing page or I need $300 for social media ads or $25 to purchase a dom domain. Mm -hmm. You can create a crowdfunding campaign on Launch Leader to outline specifically the different components of what you need funding for, starting with that application for the $390. Okay. So, um, so after this, uh, I can definitely share this with the rest of the audience, but this is a kind of a pre-crowdfunding platform to raise funding in preparation for a larger launch of a, of a product or service. Great. So, um, so definitely check them out and, um, and I think that'd be a great way for you to proceed. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Very good. So without further ado, Arthur, I apologize for, uh, for the wait. Uh, you know, now, now we have the next half hour dedicated to you. Um, so you have a very interesting situation. Uh, you have, you, you've been working on this for over 35 years. You're from the area where the, uh, where the lake is from. You worked uh, seven years 
to actually uh, perfect the mineral rights with the state. So you, you legally own 36 square miles out of a total of 42 square miles of mineral rights under this lake. Uh, tell us about your background. Who is Arthur uh, Ambrosino? I'd love to know what your background is and why you're so interested in, um, in uh, digging into this lake, I mean, aside from the obvious. Uh, so give us give us a little of your background, uh, Arthur, and, and we'd love to hear it. Well, I, I could care less about the value of the minerals. Uh, I was I started this uh, to solve some problems on the Great Sacramento Lake uh, that have to do with the shallowness, uh, which has to do directly with uh, the pollution in the lake. Uh, it goes from 280 billion gallons at full pond. Uh, they draw it down by about 25 feet a year to make space for uh, the snow melt uh, in the spring, uh, which brings it down to a little bit less than 100 billion gallons. There's 280 billion gallons uh, at full. And uh, so there's pollution problems, there's navigation problems, and uh, the lake would be sterile if it wasn't for stocking, uh, so it's a, a fisheries issue as well. So once I got started in it, then I realized that what my real passion was, and that is to solve the worldwide freshwater impoundment crisis. And I, while I was at university, at, at Columbia University, I prepared a paper for the United Nations Millennial Corporation on um, uh, two states in Africa, uh, Ghana and Uganda, with different mineral suites, mind you, uh, to, uh, to uh, prove that you can use minerals to pay for freshwater impoundments because today the state of the art is you put a dam up on a stream or something and then you sell the water off for 50 or 100 years to pay back what it costs you to put the dam up. So this is the first ever uh, project of this kind, even though we have thousands of sand harvesting operations around the world. Uh, you want to know why uh, I own the mineral rights in the lake bed is because uh, if you can do the same thing at a sand bank, only you only get uh, recoveries of about 30 to maybe as much as 40 percent of the minerals, but by specific gravity and water, you can get 95 to about 95 percent recoveries of these minerals. So uh, then I went on this. So if you're wondering why it took me so long, I've spent years and years and years trying to make people see that I can pay for freshwater impoundments, and I thought that everybody would be interested in the idea, but nobody's interested in the idea. What they're interested in is uh, the money and the minerals. So the more I look, the more I look, the more I look, the more I realize, holy mackerel. Uh, I mean, it's stunning to me that the lake is about 80 years old. As I said, it's man-made. It stuns me every time I think about it that nobody ever took a magnet down to the beach. Uh, you, I mean, you can't, you can't even believe it. If I showed it to you, it would make your jaw drop. And so uh, I figure, uh, and I've done a fair amount of work on this, that I can do this in uh, – 10 to 15,000 places around the world. I can do it uh, uh, in hundreds of places here in the United States. Uh, so that's my big thing. And, and the other thing I want to say to Roxanne is that the, the, the one thing that uh, makes me emotional about what I'm doing is how much I'm going to be able to help people. I, I, I don't need any money. I'm healthy. I'm happy. I'm a serious athlete. I don't need, you know, one and a half trillion dollars worth of minerals. Uh, but what I've done here in Fulton County in the Second Dodge Basin is I've created the next hundred, maybe 150 years 
worth of industry. So it's a big, big deal. I and mean, this is a big, big deal worldwide. Uh, we have one sand harvesting operation in the United States that's in Stark, Florida. It's run by DuPont, and DuPont is talking about partnering with me because um, uh, the, the, at first they dismissed it because uh, they are sand harvesting ilmenite in beach sands, uh, which are a lot more mature because the you know from wave action uh, they've lost a lot of their iron, so they're about 65% titanium. These are typical ilmenites from like anywhere in the world, from 45 to 55%. Uh, uh, titanium, uh, my sands in the Great Sagandaga Lake happen to be about 51% titanium. But uh, they're coming around to uh, the end of their operation in Stark, Florida. They've uh, used up their deposit, which was 15 miles long by 3 miles wide. And, uh, and uh, they're going to I think they're going to partner with me and, and I can use their equipment and their uh, separation equipment. So to talk to a little bit more about uh, sand harvesting these minerals, what it means is that you sand harvest the minerals uh, right from the lake bed and you, re and, and you recover uh, 10 to 12 percent of the sediments have value including all the minerals that I was talking to you about before and many others. Then at that point they're worth between four and six hundred dollars per cubic meter. Then you bring them on shore, that 10 to 12 percent, and you separate the minerals by species. Then they become worth five to seven thousand dollars per cubic meter. Then uh, once they're separated by species, and by the way, the numbers that I gave you uh, where the lake bed contains one and a half trillion dollars worth of minerals are only, only take into account the first two phases of money, the first two pools of money uh, for sand harvesting these minerals. The third phase is to, is to take these separated by species, so I'd separate the magnetite from the ilmenite, from the alanite, from the xenotime, and on and on and on. Then, uh, if I process them, they become worth between uh, anywhere from twenty to seventy thousand dollars a metric ton. So you can think about it this way, uh, a cubic meter of sand, of, of, of uh, magnetite, for example, in the, in the lake bed uh, isn't worth that. Some of these uh, minerals are, are only worth uh, five, six thousand uh, dollars a metric ton. Um, but, uh, uh, but when you, but then, uh, when you uh, make steel out of them, for example, you create a whole uh, uh, side chain or uh, uh, value added uh, stream. And so, I mean, this, this really, really gets enormous. And then you have the fourth pool of money where, let's say, I take the magnetite and I isolate the, that mineral. Then in the third pool, I make steel out of it. Then in the fourth pool of money, I, I decide, do I want to make rod or pipe or sheet steel? And I make another industry there. So, you know, it just, I mean, the, the, the numbers are so astonishing, so staggering. I, I, I try only to just talk about uh, the minerals that I own in the lake bed, even though I know uh, that uh, I'm creating – the next 100, 150 years of industry in Fulton County uh, off the Sagandaga Basin. Sure. So it's a, it's a big, big deal. 
Sure, I mean, that and is... I, and, 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 and I really only care about, I mean, it's so big, I won't live it through, to see it all. Uh, and all I really care about is, uh, I, I, you know, I just want to, uh, I just want to do good. Absolutely. I mean, there is, there is, the, the project is such a large project, and I, I thank you for going into the details as well, because, I mean, you could tell that this has been your life for the, for the last 30 or so years, a big part of your life. A big uh, part. Yeah. You know, and, and so you, I mean, you, tell us about your education too, because, I mean, you, you're throwing out these amazing terms that I've never heard of before, um, you, you are you're a PhD from Columbia University, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my fir my first degree uh, when I was a young man, uh, I studied engineering and got an associate's in in civil engineering. Then I I, I wasn't really keen on that, and uh, I come from a city called Gloversville, like the glove on your hands, in upstate New York, uh, right adjacent to the lake, and. Uh, so I, I, I was keen on, uh, on leather and protein chemistry. I went to school in England, and, got, and, I, and I got a degree in protein chemistry, and I ended up uh, buying the largest sheepskin tannery in North America. We used to process a thousand dozen a day of dead animal skins, and, uh, and I, I absolutely loved it. And I made a big, big uh, discovery there. Uh, I, I actually developed uh, with the Eastern Regional Research, United States Department of Agriculture, uh, the state-of-the-art um, waste treatment system for tanneries. Everybody was uh, thinking it was all protein loadings were the problem. And I got my... Uh, inspiration from uh, the plating industry and realized that uh, uh, everything was uh, done with a metal or a metal salt. So I developed this, uh, what they call multiple pipe, that's used now in two very, very large uh, tanning centers, uh, actually three uh, around the world where they grouped uh, tanneries together. Uh, but then, uh, you know, the everything went offshore we lost our business, so I went back to college. Uh, my wife did too. She she already had a, a, a bachelor of science. She went back and got her master's and her PhD from uh, her master's from SUNY Albany and her PhD from Pepperdine. And and uh, and I went uh, I went back to school at the same time. And I I got a couple years credit for my work in England, and uh, it took me. Uh, two more years to get a, a bachelor of science in, in um, geology, and then I got a master's, and I went to Columbia for the PhD. And so I've been, I'm, I'm a scientist, I, and that's my problem. I thought that everybody would think what I was doing was, you know, the best thing since sliced bread, like creating freshwater impoundments and completely paying for them, but uh, no, uh, uh, it's different. I need what I should have probably gone to school for was to get an MBA or something like that. So I know I would know what how to do this. How, I don't know whether or not I, I should go public or whether I want to keep it private. I'm inclined to keep it private. Uh, I, I, I don't know how to raise money. Uh, I thought that I was going to uh, have a partner. He was in it. He was he was willing to put in. Fifteen million dollars, but then when uh, he, when I started telling him about um, uh, a lot of properties I wanted to accumulate to take advantage of the whole of the Sacandaga Basin mineral wealth, uh, he started uh, bulking a little bit. He's still in the picture. He still is talking to me. At least his lieutenants are talking to me. Uh, but. Uh, that set me back, and sure. so this is the very first time uh, I've never gone to a bank. Uh, I, I did present the paper to the New York uh, Energy Research and Development Agency called NYSERDA. I haven't heard back from them, but but this is the very first time I started uh, going on Twitter. I'm new to Twitter. Uh, you can probably tell from from the way I uh, tweet. 
That's uh, awesome. But I, you know, I'm. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm trying. I'm targeting people who could use the minerals. I mean, the lithium in this lake is so enormous. Uh, the the lake is. Uh, I mean, it's just and, phenomenal. You know, and you know, I mean, the, the, it's, there's two two billion metric tons of lithium ore, and that went at about ten percent lithium. Uh, in each of these minerals, that breaks down to about 200 million metric tons of lithium. That's that's all the lithium Tesla will ever need. So I'm pestering them, and I'm pestering Panasonic. And there's dozens and dozens of people in the in the storage play because everybody wants to go renewable. You can't do it without the rare earths that are in this lake. Uh, and everybody is talking about storage, and you can't do it without the lithium that's in this lake. This is a very big deal. This is a real absolutely. big deal. Absolutely, Arthur. I mean, um, you have a massive opportunity on your hands, and, um, and uh, you know, it's funny you mentioned that you're a science guy because you do remind me of Bill Nye a little bit. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I follow him. I, I tweet him too. <laughs> there you go. You get you guys can have a great. I'm, I'm tweeting everybody. I mean, I, I think that you know they must. I, I don't know. I, I I probably don't know how to do it right. That's a, a one thing that I loved about uh, that presentation I saw you gave a, a a week or so ago. It was about a forty or fifty minute presentation. I watched the whole thing and I was stunned by how creative. Uh, one can be if they know anything about uh, how to, uh, you know, utilize Twitter. I just, it, it, largely, you were talking about how you can intensify, magnify your presence on Twitter, and I, I, I don't have a clue about that stuff. Sure, and um, I mean, it, you know what? It is complicated if you're first coming at it. Um, but there are, you know, what what we try to do within the incubator is provide a lot of resources to help you with that. Um, so, so I'm guessing you might have watched. Um, did, did you watch the three Twitter tools for crowdfunding webinar? Was that the I, one? Yeah, 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 yeah. Perfect. Yeah. It, you know what, Arthur? If you implement that, um, you're almost guaranteed 5,000 new legitimate followers per month. Just that implementation. Um, if you need help implementing it, we we can talk after the show, but. That is the that is the recipe I use every 24 hours. I just follow that same recipe, and bam, it's like 5,000 new followers a month. I know. I was stunned. Like, now look, here's what I, I and I wrote you and I said, send me your email address because I but I'm doing it right now. I'm doing it better right now in person. But uh, look, I I own uh, 570 parcels of lake bed. Each one is worth almost two billion dollars. I I want to give it all away. I want to give you uh, some of these parcels. Maybe I'll give one to Roxanne. Uh, I mean, um, but it, they're worth nothing un unless I start to mine them. But they're worth a lot of money. I mean, uh, that's I I haven't figured out even yet how much I should charge for each one of these parcels. I was thinking. Maybe a million dollars or something like that to raise the fifteen million, twenty million dollars that I need. Uh, but uh, I, I can give you a, a, a state. Of course, there are some maintenance fees. Cost me about twelve thousand dollars a year to keep all these parcels. Uh, but that's peanuts. I mean, you know, considering what they're worth. You know, and, and that's what I need. I need somebody like you. Who, who uh, like I need to? Uh, I've got a real good team, by the way. I've got uh, uh, five or six people that are some of my best friends. Uh, they're involved in uh, sampling and valuations, uh, GIS because there's a lot of infrastructure, uh, railroad that's got to come in and out of this basin, or we're going to resurrect an old railroad. On and on and on. I've got. I've got I've got a real good crew, but I don't have anybody that knows social media or how to raise money or anybody in finance yet. I don't have I need I need uh, a, a bigger team. And and you know what I agree with you. Um, I, you know number one, 
I'm, I'm flattered <laughs> that, that you would offer that to us. Um, no, number two, um, with what you have, I think you just need some introductions uh, because, you know, in, in your scenario, trying to raise $15 million to actually build the facilities, uh, do certain maintenance things around the lake, go through the permitting process, you need about $15 million is what you stated. Um, that is not suited for rewards campaign. So let me actually bring Chris and Nolan into this. Chris, uh, Chris and Nolan, would you say this is better suited for equity or debt-based crowdfunding rather than rewards-based crowdfunding? Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. and like, have, have you seen certain sites that you might recommend that, that you've seen that do equity and debt-based crowdfunding? Um, yeah, I mean, just there's the standard few, uh, fundable, uh, there's a few other ones. Even 15 million is quite a lot of uh, on the top one. That's exactly what I thought. Uh, I uh, and that's why I'm I'm uh, you know I'm going after all the car manufacturers uh, right in front of us. If nobody's paying attention, I don't know why. Right in front of us, all we're seeing is a switch. Uh, well, it all started a, a, a couple of months ago when Morgan Stanley released a, a blue paper called um, Renewable Energy and Storage. And they claim that if, uh, if um, we get 10% of Americans to either buy an, a, an electric car or put solar panels on their roof and, and use the Tesla's model uh, a storage bank uh, for, to draw the power back out at night, that it'll break the back of big oil and big coal. And I'm a big climate uh, change uh, uh, proponent. I, I, I want to see a switch, particularly to nuclear energy. The rare earths in this lake contain an enormous amount of thorium and uranium. So I'm a nuclear activist. Uh, but uh, that that's what I'm doing is I'm, 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 I'm pestering all these people on Twitter that uh, because right in front of us we're seeing this take place. I, I would guess that in five to ten years we're going to have probably as many as five to ten percent of the United States is going to be doing uh, 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 the population is going to be doing something in renewable and something in storage, and this is the perfect uh, deposit for that. This this uh, this uh, uh, minerals deposit, it's, it's the perfect thing. Absolutely, and so, you know, let, let me give you some advice too from what I've seen, um, and I'll share my screen as well, because $15 million is a lot. It's probably one of the larger, uh, larger... Um, uh, while you're doing that, I want to say that the, uh, the sizing plant that we would need for a whole lake deepening and the equipment for the operation of a whole lake deepening is uh, about seven to eight hundred million dollars but I'm completely confident if I get a permit in New York State that I can I can fund this project I have to get the permit first that's what GE told me GE said if you know, New York in New York State, it's near impossible to do anything. It's not like you know, New York State is the can't do state. Uh, you can't do anything. I mean, it took them thirty to thirty-five years to decide to build uh, the Erie Canal for God's sake, which opened up the Midwest to uh, to the early settlers. Uh, it, it, it took them uh, thirty to thirty-five years to decide to put the dam on this lake, the Great Sagandaga Lake, to stop the devastating floods along the upper uh, Hudson River communities. That's what is uh, the problem in New York State. But I'm completely confident that I can get a permit within three years if I can raise $15 million. Yes, and so... And so this is, and so this is what I was going to show you too, because you raise a good point. Um, 
there is no guarantee on the permitting process, of course, because you have politics involved. And so yeah. with politics involved, you, you, you can never tell an investor, I 100% guarantee that I will have a, a permit in three years. Is that right? You, you can't guarantee that? No, I can't guarantee that. But, uh, but I, I, I can tell you that uh, in this last year, year and a half, since I've started to, I, I made a, a Facebook page called the Great Second Dog of Lake Deepening Project, and holy mackerel, uh, the thing is exploding. I get uh, two, three uh, people joining every day. I mean, it's, and I, and I don't promote it. Uh, I mean, I know that the whole community, around this lake. Now there are a few stragglers, but I know that everybody around this lake wants this lake to be deepening, deepened because uh, they can't, uh, it's, it's, it's been pretty much useless. Uh, this year uh, they haven't had much rain up there. The lake is already four feet low and the lake only averages 13 feet deep. So that means a lot of shallow areas uh, in the lake, and you can only have really small boats on it. Uh, interesting, um, very interesting. And uh, sorry to interrupt, but I actually just uh, I did a quick Google search, crowdfunding for minerals. And if and if you see my, uh, do you guys see my uh, my screen yeah. right now? Yeah, exploration funded. Under crowdfunding for exploration companies, unearthing world class investment opportunities. So I'm guessing this is exactly what you're looking for. Tomorrow's resources discovered today. Exploration Funder is the first equity-based investment platform created specifically to connect accredited investors to promising early stage natural resource exploration opportunities around the globe. Mm -hmm. um, this is where I would look if I were you as far as crowdfunding is concerned, but yeah, yeah. if you were to go ahead and just do a simple Google search like what I just did, if you were to go to Google and type in uh, crowdfunding for minerals, um, there is probably going to be an additional bunch of things you could do. For instance, right here, Energy, Oil, and Gas Crowdfunding Conference, um, the Soho Loft. So I've been to these guys' events in New York for real estate crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. um, there are some heavy-hitting uh, fat cats with a lot of money at these at these conferences, and so. Another, you know, if for your for your example, I think it's going to involve a lot of networking, right? Yeah. So whether so, Twitter is going to be great, of course, to get to meet people because I think you and I met on Twitter. Right. Um, but from here to actually find uh, to actually find an angel investor or a venture capitalist, going to events that are like high net worth events, as you can see, tickets here alone are six hundred eighty five bucks just to attend. Right. Um, you know, going to these events, and I've been to them, I literally was in a room where at least a billion dollars was represented, if not more. Mm. Um, and so when, when you go there with, like, you know, dressed up in your suit and tie with a nice business card, mm -hmm. and you start just to network with these people, you, you might be able to find individuals who have that type of money who are going for that specific reason. reason. They're interested in natural resources. Yeah. So between, uh, between Exploration Funder and then uh, looking for events and also Googling crowdfunding for minerals or angel investors for minerals, you might be able to get to your next stage in the process. But from what I understand, your road is going to be a lot of traditional networking. Mm. Uh, and actually, if you're not using um, LinkedIn, I highly recommend using LinkedIn for this type of outreach as well. Uh, have, I, have, I, have, I do have a LinkedIn account, but I sort of um, frown on it because they they made me mad in the very beginning. Uh, they were pestering me uh, to join, and uh, I said no, and within a second they went into my uh, address book. They took all my... Uh, uh, contacts out, and it just made me mad, and so I, I sort of, you know, only play around on LinkedIn marginally. Well, very good. I mean, I mean, I see you have your your account here. Yeah. The, re the reason why I say, um, the reason why I by say, by the way, that's a fifteen-year-old picture. By the way, <laughs> that was so <laughs> Who is this fancy gentleman? 
but, uh, but yeah, for sure. Uh, I was going to say, uh, you know, you can connect with some great people on LinkedIn. Um, another site you might want to look into is AngelList. That isn't uh, so much. Uh, that isn't so much a, a site for minerals, but AngelList is where angel investors can get connected to others from around the globe. So um, I hope that helps. Uh, I hope that helps you there, um, Arthur. You have a few. You've got a homework assignment. You're going back to school. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I I, I, uh, I I own a bunch of property down here, and uh, we're starting to uh, think about getting rid of it uh, for some money to work with, some bigger money to work with. And uh, I've got one right now that uh, I'm I'm trying to repopulate or release, I should say. Uh, so I'm I'm busy. Uh, I mean, I need a bigger team. <laughs> sure. There's no well, doubt about it. Let's definitely touch base after after the webinar then and see if I can connect you with the right people. All right. Um, I definitely would like to do that. And so uh, it is 9 o'clock, but I do see we have a new guest. We have uh, Joe who has joined us. It, Joe, hi, can you please introduce yourself to the audience? Joe Chang. And... Um, I find this very, very interesting. I'm still trying to learn after a total, total failure of a crowdfunding campaign, uh, probably, I guess, two, two and a half years ago. And um, so I, I have been studying crowdfunding and trying other avenues, and so far I am drawing a blank. So I'm looking for suggestions. I, I have an idea. I've got a plan that I'm moving towards, but that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, it's good or right. It just means I've come up with something. Absolutely, Joe. And um, and, and I apologize. Uh, I uh, If you don't mind not rocking, just because it is a little bit distracting. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, it's okay. No worries. <laughs> um, so what one so let me ask you about your particular project um, and, and I I wasn't expecting you to be on this week so I'm sorry that I didn't recognize you um, but what what's your particular uh, project that you're working on exactly uh, I have an invention that I call stacked blades that the math on stacked blades is based on high-pressure water hoses uh, and calculus. If you, the way you teach calculus, I teach math and, and history, but the way you teach calculus is you teach people to uh, slice thin slices of dy, dx, and, and consider things that way. And to me, the high-pressure ho hose is like a series of washers. If you think of them as a series of, of, of smaller washers, getting smaller as a funnel. And the water hits the, the largest one, spills over along with the water that would normally hit the second one, and that spills over into the third one. And each time it's building up more pressure so that when it finally reaches the, the end, it is high pressure. And that could be just a high-pressure water hose. Uh, you could actually set it up to cut metals. Uh, the dentist uses it as a water pick. I mean, you, you can get it pretty small. Uh, and I use the same basic concept except with windmill blades so that instead of getting high pressure coming out the end that high pressure is collected and being used to turn an axle uh, which in turn is hooked to the generator. I built a small model using airplane propellers for my my blades and it showed a 400 percent improvement in in power production in, in RPM power production. So it has, I think, a lot of potential. I redesigned the blade slightly in order to collect that spillover better. Um, but wind energy 
and all renewable energies so far have a problem that, uh, for example, solar, when there's no sun, when there's no sun, there's no uh, power. When there's no wind, there's no power. Uh, and so the big problem would be to overcome that. And the way I came about or came up with to overcome it was to uh, add small methane jets. Just like on the 4th of July, you have uh, gunpowder pinwheels. They just spin like crazy. Well, there's no reason that won't work firing them periodically in order to maintain a consistent RPM. Uh, and by taking the blades and in high winds turning them, it's possible, I believe, to control the wind from 100, maybe even as much as 120 miles per hour down to zero and keep the RPMs within 80% to 100% efficiency. Interesting. Very and so never, never before has has the idea even been considered that you can control the RPMs of wind. You're just kind of at the mercy of whatever the wind is. And here, I I, I think I can maintain a and control the RPMs of wind from a Cat Two hurricane down to absolute still air. You know what? I'm I'm gonna actually have uh, Arthur, you know, comment in on Arthur. What do you think of that as a scientist? Because this is a little bit way over my uh, <laughs> my knowledge yeah. level, but this is interesting. It, mine too. Uh, I, I I'm flu I'm uh, somewhat familiar with fluid dynamics, but uh, I would suggest uh, General Electric. Uh, they're big big into wind right now and uh, General Electric but where are you from by the way what's what I'm, state I'm in North Dakota oh. that's almost in the United States I know what you mean uh, well uh, uh, GE uh, in uh, in Schenectady around the old or near the old uh, Schenectady plant has uh, uh, a facility uh, a, um, a research facility there. I, I wish I remembered the exact name of it, but uh, I can probably find that uh, later. And uh, and those they would be the people uh, that you you would uh, probably want to uh, contact. While somebody else talks to you, I'm going to look for a card here that I have from somebody from that unit. Joseph, uh, I'll I'll. I'll chime in there while he looks for that. Um, so I, I did read the Idea Lab profile. I was just sharing that with the audience, kind of the profile that, that you that you had shared with us. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned that there are grants for it, but only after you have a proto for it. Is that right? you did some research on grant funding? Oh, absolutely. I've been trying to get a grant for over a decade. Okay. And I've been unsuccessful. However, we do have a local state grant that will do matching. So whatever I can raise, they will match. Uh, some of the technologies that need to be modified in order for this to work uh, could cost as much as $200,000 plus putting the entire thing together. However, I had somebody ask me, will this work in water? And I thought about it for a bit, and I can't think of any reason why it wouldn't. It's still fluid dynamics passing passing through the blades, and, and it should work the same way it does in, in uh, high-pressure water hoses, and That's except that it can be done in rivers and streams that normally are the, the flow of water is too slow for in order to collect, uh, in order to turn a generator, where what I've got, if you magnify that 400%, now I think maybe it could it could turn that generator. Um, well, and, and and I think I can build a model to do that for as little as 10 grand. Uh, and so that's kind of what I'm targeting yet for the first 
for the first shot. The problem is, is the market is well. There's no such thing as as a what I call a water mill, and so therefore there's no market for it. Which means you'd have to educate maybe municipalities if, that are on rivers that they could get these, put them in their rivers, and be self-sustained as far as their electric power goes. But they have no budget towards that. I mean, it's creating a market that doesn't currently exist in an area that is highly against change. And, and so that makes the marketing of it very, very difficult. Uh, but it would prove absolutely unequivocally that the stack blades portion of, of the wind works. But in order to uh, get the methane to tie in, uh, there's things like a baby digester, uh, PSI booster, uh, you've got to modify a controller so that we can get methane to pass through the uh, through a rotating hub. Uh, the small jets have to be uh, modified for exactly the kind that, that you want or that would be wanted. Uh, there there needs to be a muffler because there those jets are normally and naturally very very elastic. I have a muffler and probably a flash suppressor so that if it's going off during the night we are getting bright flashes. Uh, and that's more for marketing than for for uh, the ability for it to operate. So there's a lot of these little things that have to be done that don't have to be done to do it in water, but in order to market it outside. However, once that's done. These don't have to be very big. They could be uh, 10, about 15 to 25 feet to the to the hub, and and a 10 to 15 foot uh, diameter. It doesn't have to be the real, real big ones because if more energy is needed, add another set of stack blades, and you you just increase the uh, what what's being collected. So. Smaller ones could be used. Well, I, I found that. Uh, look, I uh, you need to get in touch with GE because they are making power with underwater windmills. I know that. Um, and uh, you you you'd also want to uh, contact people in what they call pump storage. Uh, high, they're they're like hydroelectric uh, power dams. The only thing is they they uh, have a body of water. They pump water up a mile or so up the mountain, and then they let it back down. They pump it up with the turbines, and then they, they let the water back out and create power. We have one here in New York that uh, subsidizes the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the trains in New York City because they're all electric. But here's who you need to get in touch with. It's GE Global Research. I can give you a telephone number. I, I, I'm not going to give you this guy's name because he's into mining, electrification technology, mm -hmm. vehicle electrification. That's all up my bailiwick. And energy storage, that's me. But they're at one research circle, K-1, 1C29D, Niskayuna, that's N-I-S-K-A-Y, U N A New York one two three zero nine, and it's uh, a t I'll give you a telephone number. It's five one eight three eight seven five zero two four. You're going to fit right in with that group. I I promise you. I I I love I love seeing that, and um and just so you know as well, uh, both Arthur and Joe. In that mass email that you got to actually join this webinar, I would also reply to that email to each other, uh, so that uh, in case Joe wasn't able to get that um, over the webinar, at least you can do it through email afterwards. You guys have each other's information. Okay. I cool. I appreciate that because you must have seen my face. That no, I was not getting it. <laughs> I, I did. I noticed it, and I was like, he, he's not writing it. <laughs> Uh, I'm a lot like you. Uh, I, I'm a scientist, and I I don't know much about the world of money, and that's a big that's a big problem. 
<laughs> well, I kind of run in a different direction. I, I teach math and history and economics and things like that. And so, but but I'm an idea person. I, I understand concepts. And I can take a concept from way over here on the right and way over here on the left, and I can see how those can come together where nobody else has done before. I know. There's a thread between everything. You're right. Absolutely. And, and so that's kind of what I've done here is, is uh, I'm, I'm taking this high pre – I don't understand why somebody hasn't come up with this before because it's very simple. The simple is always the uh, the best, and that that's the, what I was telling to the guys before you joined. Uh, I can't get over why nobody's ever taken a magnet down to the beach in this lake. Uh, over, I, I, it just baffles me. I ask myself all the time, why me? Why, you know? But I'm the one who's I'm the curious one. So so are you. So you yeah. you go places. You both are, are the chosen ones. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to ask um, I wanted to ask uh, Nolan and Chris. I know they're having connectivity issues. Uh, are you gentlemen still there? They might not be. Uh, they might not be connected, unfortunately. But I I did want to share with you something that they actually turned me on to. And this is for Joe, uh, and actually this is for you, Roxanne, as well. Um, they actually uh, turned me on to this new grant program from Wells Fargo. It's uh, it's the Wells Fargo contest. Please vote and share if you can win. So our, our two guests, the two co-founders from Head Talker, are currently looking for votes for a program. And when I went and looked at what their program was all about, it looks like Wells Fargo is basically giving away uh, twenty five thousand dollars to the uh, best uh, to to the best ideas that. Um, that they that they ultimately deem uh, deem fit, and you could actually vote for them by clicking the vote button, on uh, and voting for Head Talker. Uh, if you want to enter the contest, we can give you that link afterwards. I think this will be good for anyone. But if you enter the contest, you really just have to be an established business that's been in business for six months, and you qualify for the twenty five thousand dollars. You can get all the official contest rules. You could enter. And it's it's free money. You might as well just try it, Joe, and um, hopefully that can be a way that you can get that ten thousand dollars to create that prototype, at least on a very uh, minimal scale. That 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 could be. Yeah, I mean, so you know, in in, in programs like that, you actually don't need a prototype. They're they're just uh, they're they're just awarding it based on the idea and answering five simple questions on what would you do with the twenty five thousand. That, that sounds good because right now what I'm trying to do is raise the money to build a prototype. My thought is if I can get the river one going, uh, I can get – I know I can get a government grant to set that up in business once I've got the prototype. It will add a $10,000 cost uh, to get it – to build a prototype. If I can get a matching grant from the state, that means I only need five thousand. Now we're talking money that's you know a little bit more reasonable to get. Um, and and uh, what I'm going to do with the river, I'm not sure, because if I were to have my own generators in the river and I lease the river, bo the bottom of the river, which I've checked with attorneys on on doing that, um, it's kind of like they're guessing that it'll be like like uh, renting rangeland out here for cattle. It, it, it's a, it's wide open. Uh, nobody else is using the bottom of rivers, so so you know getting hold of those. But now you're talking maybe a million dollars a pop to be able to you know build a a, a, a large generator to go at the bottom. Uh, There's a lot of utilities that have hydroelectric power. Uh, facilities where it sounds to me like your idea would be really smart, uh, and GE of course uh, is uh, uh, like world renowned for gas and uh, steam turbines. Uh, so uh, I, I think I think you're a perfect fit for GE Global Research. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and, um, and Joe, I, I I second that notion, but um. I did want to. I, I did share this website with Roxanne, but I think it also would uh, would be for you as well. 
I mean, this platform is a rewards-based platform, but it's crowdfund your prototype MVP to succeed in a kick in a larger campaign. So this site launched in there. You can definitely test this out just to see if it could help you, but it's almost like a pre-crowdfunding campaign uh, to raise the funds you need to ultimately go to the next level, uh, specifically for your prototype. But it's, it's a rewards-based channel. It's still going to be very much so operating very similarly to what a regular crowdfunding campaign would be. So just, um, just keep that in mind. Yeah. Very interesting. Thank you. You got it. Um, all right, so it's uh, 9.20. We're a little bit over. Um, I guess now we'll just we'll just have closing remarks from everybody. Um, Roxanne, uh, thank you for patiently waiting. I know you were the first one up, and now you've been patiently waiting. We'll, we'll give you the last word first. Uh, so uh, go right ahead and, um, and just uh, close us out for the evening uh, with, with your last words. Okay. Well, thank you all. Uh, nice meeting everybody. Just... Uh, Enjoy Dawkins. Uh, wish me luck. And I guess that's it. Thank you for all your help. <laughs> Wonderful, Roxanne. Thank you again for joining us. Um, and uh, and I really do recommend using the Q&A function in the incubator to, to allow the community to help you fill out your uh, your 501c3 application or uh, at least as a, as a grounds to, uh, to see if you could fill out the other application. Uh, for the fiscal sponsorship, so we'll we'll be there to help you all along the way. Um, Joe, uh, you were this you were one of the last people to come in, but we'll give you the next last word. Uh, any last words for your, uh, the audience? Well, I appreciate the information. Uh, I find this a very fascinating group, and and I hope everything is going to work the way I understand it certainly could work, and and it's kind of exciting. Uh, I have been piddling at this for uh, over a decade, and I feel it needs to move. <laughs> I, I am not getting younger. <laughs> you know what, and Joe, I mean, the, the fact that you're passionate about what you do uh, is going to get you to the next level. I mean, yes, roadblocks come, and hopefully uh, over time, we, we can break through those, but uh, but education is the key. You, you know that you're a teacher, so learning learning new things that you do, that, that you don't currently know is what's going to help you break through the the current barriers. So, thank you for joining us tonight and for joining the incubator. Thank you. Um, and then Arthur, uh, aka uh, Arthur the Science Guy, <laughs> um, yeah. can you uh, can you please uh, s sign us off for the evening? I will. Uh, I, I I thank you very much. It's been fun, and uh, I, I I I wanted to make a couple of notes that um, I I'm getting emails that say so and so wants to friend me on uh, your reality uh, crowd uh, TV, and I go ahead and open up the link. I just I hit on the link, and. Uh, after the first one or so, or first two or three, now uh, I don't know if they're receiving my or my extension of friendship back or not because there's no sign-in anymore. It just automatically uh, takes me into the site. So uh, I don't know if I'm doing that. I, I don't, you know, I want I, I certainly want to be. Uh, sociable uh, with them uh, uh, and, uh, and and that's that's a good point let me uh, let me share something with you really quick and I'll and I'll be able to show you where once you're signed in I'd be able to show you where um, where you could actually approve friend requests so I'm going to uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna log into my CEO's um, my, my former CEO's uh, account so you guys can see uh, how this works. So if I receive the friend request via email and I log into the actual uh, community, so I'm doing that right now, um, anyone who has requested my friendship, if that link doesn't take me to their direct profile where I can accept, then it will take, 
it, then it will take me to this member homepage. And if you see here, if you have any pending friend requests that you want to, that you actually want to, um, well, it's a little bit too big. Any pending friend requests that you actually want to approve, you would have a little section to do that um, right below the member, the, the who's online section. So oh. whoever's online, you see that there's requests here, 11 mm -hmm. friend requests. You would click on that, and okay. then you just click Add Friend. So now oh, I, I see. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So, so if you're ever on the site and you have that issue again, um, that's, right that's how you would do it is you would just go ahead and, and click Add Friend. Okay, thank you. Does that, does, that, uh, does that solve the question? Well, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll hit the link the next time I get an email and... I've just been worried that they they thought I was unfriendly or something because I uh, when I hit my link it, it goes to this page and not to that home page like uh, you just had up there so yeah. I don't know yeah, yeah I mean you know what yeah if you if you just hit the home button um it should it should take you where you need to go but I'm glad you shared that because I'm sure you're not the only one who has that question okay so thank you. Right. Um, great. So it's about 9:30. We've gone a little bit over, but this was all good stuff. We got to meet three great uh, members of our incubator. We got to meet two great mentors who unfortunately had internet connection problems with uh, Chris Labonte and Nolan Thompson from Head Talker. And uh, we'll continue doing this. Um, did, did you all find this valuable? Yeah, I I did. And um, yeah. And uh, again. Uh, I think I think we should talk about uh, you know maybe there are people like you that I can bring on board somehow either you know offer them a, offer them a parcel or something like that uh, to uh, help me through this uh, to be part of the team. You know what? Um, it, it does sound enticing, especially someone who understands the business that you're in. Um, and, and, and like I mentioned, I, I have a client who seems to be, he also is a PhD. He has a, he has a PhD in engineering, and he's the very well-off gentleman. He's now a serial entrepreneur, but he seems to be the guy that I need to introduce you to because... You know, he, he does, like, the uh, the engineering and all the electrical in the World Trade Center. So he understands engineering as well. So he might be a good person for you to talk to because um, you guys not only would hit it off from a, you know, potential fiscal perspective, but just with your backgrounds in engineering, he might be a good a good contact for you. So and Where do you live? What I, <laughs> I live in Connecticut. Oh, you live in Connecticut. I've got family yeah. in Connecticut. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Well, actually, I, one of the things that I'm thinking of with, with that mention would be building, finding people that might be interested in being on, on my team. Because up here in North Dakota, it's cold. That's what we've got. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know what? We've got a lot of oil. That, that, they, they, the yeah, we have lots of oil. We yeah. have lots. Of, we have lots of wind. Yeah. But, but um, uh, they we, we had schools closed last year because it got below fifty, below zero. Mm. And and the the schools got closed statewide. The whole state. The governor said shut them all down. <laughs> so uh, uh, my being able to find people that fit in with this kind of a out of the box concept is is kind of difficult because it just isn't my my city here has a hundred houses I mean just to give you an idea <laughs> the entire state of North Dakota has a population equal to greater uh, greater Richmond Virginia <laughs> I mean this this state is spread out, and finding somebody is not easy, especially that might be able to fit into a team building type of thing. And and I would be extremely interested in finding people that would be like minded, and you know, in order to do that. 
plus the fact that I'm new here, as my wife is pointing out. Yes, I'm, I'm new here as well. So that would be something I would be very interested in. I'm not sure whether that would be I, – I don't know enough about this site yet to even know how to ask the question or whether that would be something that would be appropriate to ask. Is that you know, solicitation, which of course we aren't supposed to do? <laughs> you know what? Uh, let me let me mention this because that has the you guys are bringing up good points because uh, our our site is not specific for crowdfunding as far as creating a project page and getting money from our site. So it's not a crowdfunding site in that regard. It's more of a a pre-launch platform to prepare entrepreneurs to raise the funding they need. But you both and all three of you, I believe, raised this, you all need help, not necessarily monetarily, you need help in just knowledge and crowdsourcing and things like that. Yes. So, I mean, maybe there can be a future feature that we need to implement that will be a matchmaking service in that regard. Somehow you crowd will... Crowd sharing. Yeah, crowd sharing. <laughs> something like, you know, like... Co, you know, there are sites out there already for this. Like, you know, Co-Founders Lab helps you find a co-founder. Founder Dating helps you find a co-founder. Um, all these other sites, there, there's separate sites that have this, but there's none that, there's none I think that allow us to have as much community as we can build here. Like within Vicken, there's just more of a community feel. There's people who are engaging with each other, whereas it's kind of hard to make that kind of relationship with the other sites. Um, it might make sense to come up with some sort of, even if it's like a weekly hangout that is run by the community that's like, you know, get, get to like, you know, a crowdfunding happy hour, meet people who might <laughs> want to work with you. We all have like a beer on air or whatever, whatever, you know, whatever you like to try. <laughs> um, but I mean, really the sky's the limit. We're, this is a new platform. We can, uh, we can provide that service in any way that we find that we can. But, but I agree. I, I think that would be something that, you know, not everyone wants to be the founder. They want to be, they also might want to help. So, you know, good good points by everybody. I do unfortunately have to close it out for the night because I do have to uh, sign off. <laughs> but, um, but I thank you three very much for joining us. I thank the two mentors who joined us. And I also thank the audience who was able to watch us this evening. Um, really appreciate everything. Uh, it was it was a great discussion, and uh, looking forward to having more of these. So until next time, dream it, believe it, achieve it. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.